Welcome to DevOps Clinic. My name is Matt, and I've been a Linux system admin, network engineer, and DevOps engineer for over 25 years. I'm also a SaltStack certified engineer. We'll be continuing on with our getting started with Salt project. In part one, we showed you how easy it is to install Salt on your servers. If you haven't seen that yet, you can look for the link in the description. Go ahead and watch that. If at any time you have any comments or questions about this video, please leave them in the comments below. We are here to help you learn how to be a better DevOps engineer or Linux system admin. So if there's anything we can do to help, please let us know. Before we get started, I want to tell you about our sponsor. Personally, I've been using Linode for over 10 years. I choose them not only because they provide reliable Linux servers, but also they offer services like fast disk storage, an easy to use web manager, and data centers in 11 markets. Not to mention they have great uptime. And if you click the link in the description below, not only will you help out our channel, but you'll also receive a $100 credit just for signing up. All right, let's get back to it. Today we are gonna learn some of the reasons why I love the SALT project. We we're talking about remote task execution. Remote task execution is the ability to run commands on one or more remote servers. They can run in parallel or one after another, but the key thing is that they run in real time. Think of them as one-time actions like restarting services. To find the available execution modules, which is what SALT calls it, we want to go to docs.saltproject.io and click documentation on the top. Then we want to scroll on the right to SALT module reference and then execution modules. Modules listed under execution module are only used for real-time remote task execution. One thing to keep in mind with execution modules, it's entirely possible to use execution modules in a bash script to maintain how a server is configured, but please don't do this. In a future episode, we'll cover configuration management and orchestration. This is really just so we want to run a command at this moment against the servers. All right, previously we set up a salt master and the minions, and I showed a command called test ping and this would show which servers are up and responding to SALT. But before we get started in showing you the remote task execution modules, I wanna just go over some basic targeting. And targeting is when you specifically run commands on specific servers. And there's more advanced techniques I'll show in a later episode, but for right now, I'm just gonna show some basic techniques. So we know that we've got a server called salt which is a rain salt master and we've got three minions minion one two and three and if we want to target a specific minion we can put in the host name instead of asterisk so if we do this we can see it's only going to send the command to minion one but typing out the fully qualified domain name every single time can be a bit of a pain, so we can also use an asterisk in here, which makes it a lot easier to type. But let's say you want to um, target all of the minions. You can add an asterisk instead of the number there. And this could be really helpful if you've got servers you know, web servers, maybe they're called web one through 100, and you want to target all of, you know, one through nine, you could do web zero star, or you could do other stuff like that. Okay, now that we have some basic ways to target, when we don't want to run the command against all servers. Maybe we want to run against one or two. I want to show you the very basics of remote task execution. And this first execution module I'm going to show you is called command.run. And while I'm showing you this, I highly encourage you to go through, read the documentation, find the modules that you should use. But sometimes command.run is really helpful when you're just trying to get something done. So let's say we want to run against all servers for right now. We can do cmd.run. And let's say we just want to see what the uptime of these servers is. 
uptime is a standard Linux command, and so we're saying all servers run uptime and give us the result. And you can see all four of these servers have been up about 41 days. We can also do things like, let's show all the processes running. Now this is going to be a really lot of information. But you can very quickly see how you can use command.run to send commands to a remote server and bring back information that you need. Here's one that I have used from time to time. Let's get the directory contents of salt, Etsy salt. And we can see how for each server it brings back the ls command results. Again, command.run is really helpful. You can just take any bash command, put it in here, and it'll run on the remote server as long as it normally runs when you SSH into those boxes. I would encourage, again, reading the documentation, finding better modules. All right, let's move on. As a sysadmin and DevOps engineer, a lot of times we're working with files. So let's give some examples of files, kind of like we just did the ls for a directory. Let's use the file module. And if we use the command read dir, this is going to allow us to read the directory of whatever we specify next. So if we were to specify etsy salt, this is very similar to the command.run where we put in ls-lesf etsy salt. This is a native salt command. And obviously this is the type of thing we would want to use instead of command.run. Maybe we then want to modify the command and look in the minion.d folder. And you can see here it brings in those folders. The only thing with this is it doesn't sh tell you what is a file and what is a folder. You'll have to know which is which just by looking at them. All right, let's look at another example. Uh, so a common thing that you may want to do is to look to see if a file exists across multiple systems. So if you use file.file underscore exists, what this will do is this will run a command on the far side and it'll tell you true if the file exists or false if it doesn't. Or let's say you want to know, maybe you're having issues with the file mode is wrong. So we can do file.get underscore mode. So let's look at passwd, what it's set to. And you can see here on across all systems, 0644. That's all great, but what about if you want to get access to a file? How about if we do this? Let's look at minion1 because sometimes files can be large. So the file module has an option called read. So file.read, and let's look at what is in the minion.d minion.cont file. And again, if you were to run this against multiple servers and you have really large files, you just want to make sure you're narrowing down your results. But right here, the minion.conf is actually a pretty small file, and we can see that in that file it just has master and then the IP address of our master. All right, let's look at one more file example. So let's say we wanted to look at the Etsy salt minion configuration file. And again, this is the one that has all the configuration options, very long, and I encourage you to put everything in the minion.d folder. But let's say you wanted to get some information out of it, and you could obviously bring back the entire file, and it's going to look like this. There's a lot of information to go through. But let's say you knew what the thing was you were looking for. So let's do minion1. If we were in bash, you might use grep to look for that. So the file module has an option called grep. And we can specify the file name. And then let's specify port. We want to find what port is it using. If we were to just run it like this, no options, that would be just like typing grep port. 
but maybe we want to do case insensitive. And if you were to do hyphen hyphen space hyphen dash i, because grep dash i is case insensitive. And any of the grep options can be placed in here. And we can see here it brought back every line that had the word port in it. So set the port, master port, TCB pub port. All right. Okay, let's continue. So another thing that DevOps engineers and Linux system admins are doing all the time is checking what services are running or starting or stopping them. So Salt has what's called the service module. So if we were to do service.status, and I need to learn how to spell status. Let's say we wanted to see if SSH is running. Now the name of the service on Linux is sshd. It's going to publish this command. They all come back saying that SSH is not running. All right. Well, what if we wanted to stop it? Now, obviously we don't want to stop this on the server that we're on because that would be bad. We would lose our connection. So let's use minion one. So service stop sshd. And we can see here, it says true. And previously when we had status, they were true as well. So in this case, status being true means it's running. When you run service.stop, what it means is it successfully stopped the service. And if we were to run status again, we can see that minion one says false, it is not running. What about if we want to restart? So we can see it answered true. So when issuing a restart, it was successful. And if we look at status again, they're all running now. So service also has pretty much all the other system CTL functions that you normally find. So if you wanted to enable a service, we could do that successfully enabled. We can also disable. Now, how do we know that it's disabled? One way to check it would be service.disabled. And you can see it's disabled. You could also do service.enabled with a D on the end. This will tell you whether it is enabled or not. So obviously it's disabled, so we're gonna get a false for here. It's disabled, so we get a true for here. Always remember when you're getting a true or false as a response, what is the context that the command that you ran? So let's re-enable that. Right, so besides files and services, a lot of times we are dealing with groups and users. So let's take a look to see if there's a group called DevOps. So if we use the group module.info with the word DevOps, since it answered back with nothing, this means that there is no group on these systems called DevOps. We can also add, so group.add, DevOps. And then you can also add a group ID. So let's say one, two, three, four. As long as that group ID is not used, we'll get a true saying the group was added. And if we query for that group, it will now tell us on each of these systems, group ID one, two, three, four, there are no members for the DevOps group. Okay, let's look at some examples for users. If we use user.info, similar to the group.info, let's use the root user. Let's see what we can find out about them. 
And if we look here, we can see on all these systems, they all have the root user. So let's look at the salt server. It has a full name set, has a group ID of zero. It's part of the root group. Its home folder is root, it has no home phone set. The actual name of the account is called root. This would be the username. There's no other settings. It's obviously not going to show you a password, or room number, and you can see the shell and then the user ID and no work phone set. Okay, now let's see if there is another user. Let's see if the Matt user exists on these systems. Obviously, I haven't added to any of these servers. Okay, let's add the Matt user. So just like group.add, we can use user.add. So if we just use user.add and then the name Matt, what this is gonna do is it's gonna create the Matt user. Now, if the only option we used was Matt for the username, it's gonna automatically pick the user ID, the group ID, the home directory, and all those other settings. And in the documentation, there are lots more options for a lot of these commands I'm showing you. And we'll probably get more into in depth with what you can do with these in the future, but this is just to give you a really quick example of what we can do. But let's pull up minion one user.info for Matt. And we can see here, obviously, my group ID, my user ID, my shell, my username, and my home directory. Okay, so as we can see, I am part of my own group, the Matt group. But let's say we also want to add the wheel group to this, so give myself the ability to run sudo. One of the commands we can run is the user.ch or change groups. And then the one thing you want to do is you put the username, put the group, and if we were to just run this, it would actually just change the group. So it would take out the mat group, add the wheel group. So if we add append equals true, and this is successful. So if we were to do user info mat, we can see now I'm part of the mat group and part of the wheel group. Now, Another task we would do quite often is to delete users. So let's delete a user. Now, there are two other options we have to add to override some protections and it's remove equals true, force equals true. So we can see it removed on all the systems. And if we were to do a user info Matt. I no longer exist there. And for group, we can do the same thing. Let's say we want to do group.delete DevOps. And it's been removed there. There we go. This was just a small fraction of the available execution modules. No matter what task you need to accomplish, you can do it with SALT. I really encourage you to scroll through the docs, see what's available. You can use the command.run when you need to, it's quick, but there are so many remote commands that are available. What commands do you need to execute for your job? Leave a comment below, and I'm excited to see what you've done with it. Part three of getting started with SALT will be out soon. Be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon so you can be notified when it's available. If this video is helpful, please like and share. This helps us and shows us you find our content valuable. And until next time, automate everything.